So, you know, uh, it's interesting that a lot of you have had, I think, probably um, contact with interventional cardiology uh, uh, simulators, uh, interventional radiology, and, uh, and uh, mannequins, and probably heard of, seen, done a little bit of the, of, of the VR where it's just all virtual and there's nothing there except some sort of computer and some sort of robot that's letting you touch stuff. And, um, you know, you, these other ones are much farther along, I would say. You know, we look at what John's talking about. He's into what you all really want to know. I are really testing people, and you're getting all the different case things, all the stuff going on. And, you know, and I've been at this now for about 13, 14 years, ever since the, we first started with making the visible human. And I'll talk about some of that in here. And looking at these other applications and going, wow, that's really neat, you know, and, and, uh, and trying to get to the point where we get this very generic environment that one moment when you walk in, you're working on an eye, and then with a flip of a switch, that same situation is letting you do uh, fasciotomy, that sort of thing. And that's what I'm going to talk about here. And I hope it's of some interest. It's, you know, it's uh, technology, and uh, I'm going to try to go under the hood a little bit and say, well, these are the things that go into making this work, and this is where we are, and give you some examples. And I have to imagine that whatever we're doing, other people are doing all over the place. So I, I would just consider what you see here to be, um, you know, what's going on in the field. Uh, so I look at it as flexibility. You know, this is what's important about it. You can just change your environment so quickly. You have reuse. And uh, nowadays, the uh, plastic and, and rubbery dummies are getting to be more and more reuse. It's getting to where you can stick needles in them thousands of times and you can't see where the last person did it. Um, but that's still one of the big advantages of virtual reality is absolutely nothing got worn while you were doing this thing. And then uh, there's objective and autonomous measures. And these are the three things I, that we try to bring to all our simulators, and, and, and particularly this autonomy thing, which was talked about earlier, about how the faculty just can't be there. And uh, our experience actually in making an arthroscopy simulator, which I'll be showing you later and talking about, uh, originally I think everybody involved in the creation of that through the AOS thought that their faculty was going to be down there teaching them how to do uh, arthroscopy on this simulator. And it came as a little bit of a surprise of, no, there's going to be a mentor program, and, and you know, they come down and they do it when they can. And uh, it's all about getting the message across from the faculty to the students. So uh, these are the three things that I was kind of asked to do, and I'm hoping that what I talk about will touch on them. Um, go into virtuality in, in general, and uh, what are the benefits of it, and uh, let's see. Yeah, where does this fit into actually getting beyond the resident and trying to determine whether people are competent and, and maintenance of certification and all that? So let's talk about VR in general. Um, you generally speaking are looking to make a three-dimensional environment, something that's, that you can see. Um, it's, this is, certainly we do things with arthroscopy where it's a 2D, but we generally speaking are trying to co-locate some sort of feeling and of two hands with something of interest of there. And that can easily be the leg and it can be the head and it can be whatever. Um, high fidelity haptics, uh, I'll talk a little bit about fidelity, and, and you know, I'm a firm believer in this match the fidelity to the thing you're doing, and I think that we're trying to do things that require high fidelity. And, uh, and one of the things is the, when you talk about the expense of fidelity, there's kind of two f expenses, I think. One is the equipment that it takes to accomplish it, and the other is the technology it takes to get there in the first place. Well, the equipment, that's kind of a one-time purchase or whatever, and it, it is. It's a, it's a border. The technology, once you get it, once you know how to cut things and tear things and do all this, it's developed. And I think it is, I think VR is not going to be the expensive thing in the very near future. That it's, it's going to be actually the cheapest way to do a lot of things. Uh, high fidelity models, I think, are important. Uh, people do not really want to be working on cartoons if they don't have to. And of course, the uh, geometry of it can be very important if you're really trying to talk about what's located where and, and if that's important to the procedure. High-performance computing, I'll talk a little bit about what's going on there that I think is very interesting. And um, how the software, let's see, estimates the physiology and physics. Yes, and, I, and uh, we personally don't do a whole lot of physics in there, but in tremendous physics engines are being generated, and I'm very much looking forward to the day when they get melded together. So stereo display, if you want to see in stereo, I've uh, been doing it for years in the movie theater. Uh, You've got to get one image into one eye and another image into another eye. And there's lots of ways to do it. 
This thing in the lower left-hand corner is something we developed a long time ago that's incredibly simple. It just splits one eye off into this monitor and one eye into that monitor, and that way you have the full resolution of each monitor. It's actually the highest resolution stereo you can get out of a computer, and it's actually the least expensive, I think, that you can get. Um, it does make you, know, you have to put your head in one spot, but in general, when you get down to business on things, you're kind of in one spot anyway. Then there's other things like these binoculars and head-mounted display, and you know, people talk about where's my jet pack, you know, well, where's my binocular, where's my head mounted display that's only $5,000 and has good resolution? And it, it just isn't there. And it's coming as it's $30,000 when I got started and it's $16,000 now. And, and uh, there's a lot of work to make them less expensive. And I think that'd be really great because if you really could put something this light and look around and have your whole environment built and you reach out and grab your haptic device, you have a lot of flexibility. And haptic devices in general, they generally look like little robots. And, um, and what they are is ordinarily in a robot, you tell this, this little joint to go there and that joint to go there, and then the end effector is going to be where you want it to be. Well, instead, you say put out this much torsion and this much torsion, and that's going to put a force in a direction. This last one over here on the right, I think, is what everybody wants to have, which is a glove or a thing that's on every single finger. You can reach out and grab, but they tend to be complicated. They tend to really be very researchy. So on the other hand, what you generally have is something where you either put your finger in it or you're grabbing the tool. Well, there's a lot of things that are done with tools, and, and so that's where we tend to focus. Uh, we're not there to let you feel along the nerve and do the, all kinds of things that are super important, but if you're in the eye cutting away doing, or doing phaco emulsification or you're doing fasciotomy, in general, there's a tool. And we can even give you a tool that's your finger so that you can palpate and that sort of thing. But this is kind of what they look like, and this is what people often complain about the expense. And... Uh, they range in price from the one in the upper left-hand corner is about $2,000, and the one in the upper right-hand corner is more like twenty or 25000 and I really don't know. These other ones look like it could be more, you know. Um, but it depends on what you do with them that really depend, that determines whether they're expensive or not. Now, in the models, the one you're seeing on the right is, uh, I understand the comment about it, is that your right or left, um, is a polygonal model made directly out of the visible human male, which I'll talk about a little bit later. And because it's a polygonal texture map model, it can be run around in real time, and it's kind of the basis for what we do our VR stuff on. Uh, you'll also see little artifacts in it. There's a little blue and stuff, because there's actually blue gel in this person that we use to inflate things and, and, and fill holes as we're milling away. Uh, but it's a great start for then coming with 3D texture map painting techniques, because you're really seeing where everything is, and you can then improve them. Now, this eye on the left is something we just recently built. And if we could get, the next thing is to get that conjunctiva hooked up over there to, uh, to the tissues, and it's getting to the point where you won't be able to tell. This is as close, I think, as we've seen of something that when you look through the binocular microscope at this eye, there's very little to tell you that that's not an eye. And, of course, what happens if you reach out and it's just a computer-generated thing, you know, you wouldn't feel anything. But, in fact, we've got that. So now when you're doing the capsulotomy and things in there, you're feeling every little subtle piece of doing that. So the models themselves. Um, in general, you know, you can CAD CAM from scratch, and that's very difficult to do. That's, that's one of the many things, I think, that separates us from flight simulation is they, they built the airplane, and, and they, you, they ran all kinds of models on that thing, and they knew all about it before, before it ever came out. And that's why the simulators come out with the airplanes these days. And we've got a little different problem. And so in general, we tear the thing apart to do it. Either you put CT through it, and you're looking through it that way, or MR, or some volumetric method of gathering it. Um, our particular method is to freeze a thing solid as a rock, a specimen, and mill it away, taking a look one, take pictures all the way down. Either way, whether it was CT or MR or this, as long as it's volumetric and you've gotten it in slices, you have a fair amount of work to do after that. And this is one of the things that gets in the way a lot of, I think, a lot of VR efforts. And, and, uh, and that is, if you're going to try to segment this, you're really talking, you know, if one image has, you know, a million by a million pixels and, uh, let's see, if you're doing, yeah, a thousand by a thousand. So you've got a million pixels. You're trying to figure out every single pixel, what's in this, what's in that. It's a huge task, and it often is the kind of, I think, the threshold that keeps a lot of people from really being able to do good stuff. Uh, and, and so, but once you got that work, then you can make all kinds of polygonal and texture and, and volumetric models and things from it. And that's this, the second thing is this segmentation step and classification. And it's, it takes us roughly uh, two months now probably. 24 hours, 7, we've, we've got our milling machine and our freezer these days. We never have to take it out. Uh, two months to mill away a body and probably 50 man year, people year to uh, segment it. 
you know, and how is that done? It can be done in parallel, thank goodness, or you do the things that are important in the beginning, but it's the big block is trying to do that. Um, you need the, uh, you can make the surface models and the texture map models from that. The tetrahedral models is a volumetric description that is like a, if you think about these little triangles that make up a polygon, well, it's now a, a four-sided thing, and it has all these nice properties that let us push and deform things, and I'll show some stuff on that. Uh, if you can give them mechanical properties and acoustical properties and all that, then you started to build your virtual patient from that data. So here's the cryo sectioning. One of the first things when I walked in there and I looked at that, I thought it was some sort of end table thing. And, and you look a little, ah, oh, look at that, okay. And, uh, you know, you surround it and, and you can mill it really thin. Uh, the visible human male was milled at one millimeter each time. The female was done at one third millimeter each time. And we've taken it down to one tenth for other things that we've built since then. And you literally could polish it and take a picture, you know, and get a lot of data. And, and it, there's no point in doing that if the high re camera hasn't gotten your same kind of resolution going around it, you know. So, I mean, no use having tiny, tiny slices if your pixels are one-third millimeter in that. And, but nowadays the cameras are getting such high resolution that we can take it down and get tenth millimeter all the way around in a whole body. Here's an example of doing segmentation and classification. This actually is the high-res knee that was used for our arthroscopy simulator. And you see the yellow in there, and that's because the first high-res knee we did in there, the computer scientists and I said, ah, just do the knee, and we'll inflate the knee for you afterward. And we went in there, where in the world? It's just a potential space. Where, where is it? And we were having to work way too hard to figure out where the actual capsule was. So inflated a knee and milled it away like that, and that really took care of a lot of issues. Um, what we're showing here is a spline that's running around it, and that has turned out to be hugely important for, for doing this stuff. All of our stuff previous to this is you'd actually draw. So you get these people, and you're drawing and drawing and drawing. And I tell you, if you sit down there and try to draw a cylinder with a bunch of circles, you're going to get kind of a messed up cylinder. But if you put a spline down every 10 or so, whenever anything's happening, you put more in, it gives you a lot of control. This has let us really get the resolution. There's no point in doing a 10th millimeter knee if you're going to be doing, you know, half a millimeter resolution kind of drawing and stuff to get the data out of it. Once you've done that, now you can start to make your polygonal models. Um, once you, it's just basically the surfaces of things. Here's an example of we made a simulator to actually be putting the Hoffman II on a femur. And, uh, you know, you can show it in all kinds of ways at this point. You can uh, highlight it like you see the textbook where everything's blue and red or whatever, or you can throw the texture on it and make it realistic. However, but that's just an example of the set of polygonal models that came out of this to make something. Then when you, uh, what's nice, when you've actually used red, green, blue data to make th where this volume came from, and it wasn't CT or MR, is you actually get the, the colors. Now, it's a colors of a dead person, but it's a whole lot easier to turn the colors of a dead person into live person than it is to turn gray levels into a live person. And so with very little work here, this muscle is fairly realistic. You get in close, you actually see the fascial things going on, and, and uh, we can then cut along there and, and do fasciotomy in here. Uh, one of the big things is the visible human male or whoever you got is never in the posture you want them to be in. Or if it is, it's in the only the one posture you wanted. And so we've put a great deal of time on making tetrahedral models and actually doing what the airlines do and, you know, or, or the airplane people who make airplanes do. The, the, you, you do finite element modeling. And the visible human male, he, he stands like this. That's, that's what his position was when he was frozen. And so we've now brought this up, and we can do various things. We did this for a spasticity uh, uh, simulator and we put his neck in all kinds of orientations and we can do that real time. This takes generally speaking, well, when we, f when we first bent the high res data for the visible human or for the, um, the knee for the arthroscopy, it would take a month to do the finite element modeling to have it move from straight out to 90 degrees of flexion and then repeat that for varus and valgus all the way back and forth. Once you do that, if you only have a few parameters to control it, then you can put it in your simulator in real time. And that's what you'll see if you get over on the arthroscopy simulator is when you take the knee and bring it up, you'll see everything moving in real time. And, uh, and what's interesting is probably about five or ten years that will be in real time. Uh, but right now it's months of calculations offline and then do it. And we can move most about anything now. We've got every vertebrae all defined, and, and, and we have a driver that says, well, here's what the head did left, right, or whatever, and we can make it happen. So talked about associating properties with the volume. So what we did, since we have a volume vector data set, we can go through and give acoustic properties to it. And that little image in the upper right-hand corner is being generated in real time while the person takes the probe and runs it around on there and 
the needle goes in and you can start to do needle guided stuff in a very free form environment. And this isn't in going through anything. This is go anywhere you want on the body and pop the needle in and go through there. At the moment, the images we make are static. And so you just see the needle going in. But what we're right now doing is bringing our finite element modeling into that so that you'll see the aorta or the arteries pulsing and you'll see the deformation as the thing pushes against there. So that's a, a work in progress, but we're finding, you know, there's a lot of interest in ultrasound for all kinds of reasons, and it's nice to be able to go anywhere in the body now and just put a probe on it and calculate it. I did one talk just briefly. This is really getting techy now, and I hope is when they start to tell you they can't make it because they don't have enough computer power. Uh, you know, you probably heard what great, incredible graphics things are going on. I mean, it's incredible. When I first started this, you had to have a silicon graphics machine this size, and it had to be hooked to your PC because the silicon graphics couldn't talk to a haptic device. And about 10 years ago, the transition came where the PCs uh, with their graphics cards started being as fast as these $100,000 Onyxes, and that was a really big deal. Well, it's just gone from there on. Uh, they're, they're doing millions of polygonal models texture mapped in real time so that our sons and daughters of age 11 through 13 can kill people right and left in, in their video games all day long. And, uh, and, but thank goodness, because of that, tremendous amount of money has gone in there. Well, the way they do that is they actually have tens of processors, hundreds of processors, and uh, those hundreds of processors are on there, and they're actually available now for actually doing what we want to do, which is calculate physics and getting that kind of stuff done. Well, now that we, we just got done with this eye that we could, couldn't have done six months ago. We could not have handled having that whole thing move around, having the whole thing deform, having the very subtle feel of going through the tunnel. Uh, well, we, the latest $200 graphics card, we ran our entire algorithms on that, had 300 processors on it. Well, now the next graphics card has 3,000 of those processors on it. So for the longest time, there's this thing called Moore's Law, and it says that the computers would double every year. That just stopped, as far as I'm concerned, about eight years ago. It did not happen at all. What happened was they put two processors on instead. Oh, there's your double for the year. And then they put four processors on. If you can do it in parallel, or if the threads can work side by side, okay, you've got possibilities. Now we're talking about 3,000 of these things. And, and so if you can do your work in parallel, which is not trivial, I'll just give you one example. If, you've, if, you, if you want to move vertices because of collision, you're trying to deform this thing, well, if, if every one of my processes is working on a different patch of this, and this processor moved that, this one doesn't know about it. And in fact, it, this one moved at the same time this one does. So it's, it's really interestingly difficult to do parallel, but once you do it, once you figure out a way around that, we're doing stuff that there's the 3,000, well, it's like 3,000 times the power. And I think it's really going to change what you're going to be seeing in VR coming up. Uh, so kinds of things that should be, that, that are being done out there, okay? Um, and these are, the, if you can palpate and needles and cut and tear, you know, what we're basically trying to do is just keep adding tools to our virtual environment. And if you've got an entire body, that means you should be able to go do anything you want anywhere in that, in that body. So that's the whole theoretical thing. And uh, but at the same token, you've got to be able to change its posture and, and you want it to be alive and, and have all the kinds of things that are going to be telling you that you're doing it right, like the bony landmarks and all that. So just give you a few examples in here. So for palpation, we still actually put a stick in your hand and you run around on there. You could put your finger in a gimbal, but it's kind of a one-finger thing. And the, the thing is the haptic device is put out a single port point source in three dimensions. That doesn't mean you can't actually have more degrees of freedom, though. For example, in your arthroscopy simulator, you go through a portal. And so that's really like you do have torsion and all that. And there's nothing that stops this stick from actually stopping when it goes across that. So all of our things are, are realistic like that until you want to go in and then crank something over in which case we can't actually apply to torsion and bring it back, but you don't generally do that. And when you're palpating, it's not an issue anyway. So here, you're feeling around for bony landmarks and for pulse, and, and we use that a lot. If we're going to be trying to do a, a joint injection, we're actually going to feel for these bones, and, and, and not in a way that you're touching bones. It's got to be done so it's subtle, so you're feeling through the tissue and all that, and feeling through the thick tissue. And, uh, but that's the kind of thing that can, and, and we do well with that. Um, Here's a case of another, it's palpation again, but now it's a probe, and it's in through the knee joint, and it's pulling this little tear apart here. And that's another nice thing about VR is when the curriculum says there should be a tear here, there's a tear here. And, uh, and it literally changes just that fast. You can come back one moment later, and the tear is not there, uh, depending on what we're trying to teach you. And that's, of course, this idea of getting to see what you, what you 
what the faculty wants you to see when they want you to see it. And as far as putting a needle in it, so we're back to this guiding thing, uh, you know, VR is very good at needles, I would say. We're able to give you every little subtle pop, every little thing you're going through. If you go into a vessel, you're going to feel that loss of resistance. And, uh, and if you pull a plunger back, you're going to get blood if you're in this, or you're going to get yellowy, gooky stuff if you're in the shoulder joint. And, uh, and it's one of the places, and there are a lot of really interesting needle applications. And so that's one of the things we do all over the body. And here's a case of uh, changing the posture. Uh, in order to do, uh, this is for cervical dystonia, uh, injecting into different muscles, and so we can rotate the head anywhere we want and, and go after and do that. And, uh, and you know, that would seem trivial, of course, but uh, actually there's a fair amount of interesting finite element modeling that goes in to do that. And then you get these interesting views, too. You know, we do these things with the trainees with uh, the skin on and, and opaque and all that, but, but there's a really nice time when they're really wondering what's going on, and, boy, you open it up and they go, oh, gee, look at where I am, you know. And it's just one of the nice things that VR can do for you. Uh, we've been working on cutting and tearing, and, and that's going to be really opening up the realm of what can be done. And nowadays we can take and go in there, and if you pull this to the side, the, thing, the tear is just going on and on. And we're using that for capsulorexis and capsulotomy, and, and it'll be used for fasciotomy and a lot of others. And you can make, if your scalpel goes through there, you can make a very nice smooth curve. And then the things are truly separated. You can grab one thing and tear it off to the side. And, and uh, this is where it's going to start to really open up some interesting things. When you can take and add a scalpel to your needle, then you're going to do cut downs and get to places, and, and you're going to do all kinds of interesting surgical things. Uh, here we're doing some, this is an old version of the capsulotomy, or a capsulorexis. Uh, just started doing some FACO. You know, you're literally removing material, and uh, this is the eye before we just got done with all this eye work, and now we've got to bring the new eye over into here and, and get this capability into it. Okay, so I wanted to talk about measures and what we were able to do with that. Um, we have, with every simulator we make, we make something we call the mentor, and the mentor is supposed to be the faculty doing a few things, telling you what to do, showing you how to do it, and seeing if you did it right. So earlier, you know, uh, Dr. Tava was talking about, um, about um, combining the things, you know, that you, you, uh, you don't just have them out there on their own, that you're grading and testing them along the way. And, and in fact, testing with training is how you know if they're progressing, okay? And so there's subtle differences in, in testing, and we are at the point now where we're really good at testing that you've done what we told you to do. And I think that's a real foundational thing for what probably you're more interested in is, are you good at what you do? Um, and uh, because we made this simulator to be a trainer, we get to get away with that. We told you how to do it, and we have this whole set of uh, little bars over here, you've got to get to the left, and we're not showing them to you uh, as a trainee. I'm, we're showing them to you to see what's going on over there. And if you can't get them over there, then you're not doing it right, and you need to keep doing it until you do that. Um, the, the issue with that will be that when an expert comes in, they won't do it the way you said to do it, and you haven't really graded their expertise at that point. But it's very foundational to, uh, to doing that. If you can measure everything, and, and you can't not in a VR environment. You can't make a virtual environment in which you don't know what's going on. It can't feel right, it can't look right, it can't be right. And so all the data is there. It's a question of did that actually go to expertise. Would you show that video? I went ahead and made a, a video uh, rather than bring the simulator in here because this will get a little closer on the screen. And, and then you know, we can all see the arthroscopy simulator later. All right, I wanted to show you yeah. the arthrosim, and in particular in the context of measuring the proficiency of, of physicians. Uh, this is a simulator. You can feel like you're running into the cartilage, and you can pull on the ACL and all those things. And it's got a lot of the ergonomics of arthroscopy in that you have to actually maneuver the leg. If you want to get up in the supertoe pouch, you have to go into full extension until the patella rises up. And if I want to get into the medial compartment, I've got to get everything lined up looking off to the left and actually push against the leg. You can see if I let up, the joint goes down. If I push hard, I can open up there and then slide it in. And because there's haptics, it just slides right into the spot if you've lined everything up. Okay, and then we're going to be tugging, etc. So over on the left is what we call the mentor. And I am on a page that wants me to work on the medial meniscus. So if I hit the red button, 
up it comes and at this point I've already got some of the measures already lined up like the flexion and the valgus. I'm going to bring up something that we don't generally show the students but this would give you a better look at what's going on in here. So these little slider bars every one of them if it gets to the left of one then it's considered successful. As I push on the valgus you can see the top slider bar going over to near optimum. If I take the camera and have a point in the wrong direction or if I move around in there and get in the wrong place, all those slider bars move along. But if I get down here and get a good view, every slider bar is left of one. In order to complete the rest of the task, I get in here and, and, um, and I pull up on the meniscus. If you look a little bit to your left there, John, you'll see the uh, score going up. Your left, go to your left, there you go. You see the 75%. Now if I get on top of this and push down, it goes to 100%. So now I go on to the next step, a new set of measures, and in fact over here on the right side you're actually seeing a hint image telling you what you want to do. Uh, it says get the light post like that, valgus, all those things are the same on this, it's just move over to the right and then push down and get under and lift it up. 100% on to the next task. In this one it's telling me to look straight down and to give a tug on this. So the, the point here is that if you are training someone then you can say precisely what they're supposed to do and you can expect them to do precisely that. I'll go back up to the top measure one and uh, yeah, let's see, I can back up because I got 100% on everything it took me on to the next task. So if I go into there and I bring up those measures again if I get, if I just set this down virtually everything is out of whack over there. If I turn the camera upside down and all that, the um, Z position might be right just by coincidence. Bring it up, every slider goes over, and we're able to judge what they're doing. And I use the word judge, and that's the mistake. I don't want to say that, because we're not judging what they're doing. We're making sure that they're doing everything we said to do in a certain way. And this next step that needs to happen if you really want to judge proficiency is to bring some judgment in. Um, you need to count more did they tug on something and take a picture of it than did they put the light post in a particular angle. I guess what I should have shown in here is if I come in and get this view, I could look up instead of to the side. That's a little more difficult, but that's a decent view. I could probe it from there, but I wouldn't pass our measures with that. And that just makes the point that there are other ways to do things. And where we have the luxury on this particular machine is that the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons set these measures for us. And so, it, you know, if you're going to believe somebody, you might as well believe them. But again, it doesn't get to judgment. If I go one more step here, and we go to uh, examination one. In this particular one, what we do is we put less emphasis now on exactly how you do things and more on what you do. I happen to know that there's a tear in the meniscus on the lateral side, so I'm going to put this up here, give it some varus, slip on in here, and there's the tear. Now that tear wasn't there until I came to this page. Now if we look over there at the score I've got, I've got 1%, but if I photograph this guy, I'm at 33%, and I give about the same amount of weight for getting this entire procedure done under time and there's one more one in here to get so that if you went in there and found the other one and photographed as well and did uh, but didn't do it the way we had said you'd still get about an 85 or 90 percent in here and so that's kind of the next step towards bringing judgment it's still using all those measures but it's saying let's really wait what's important and what's not what we want to do after that is get to the point of really look at the image processing if this is an image that they should have then we should give them credit, and it shouldn't matter how they set it up. When we can do that, then experts can walk in, and we'll be able to judge them. Now, we can judge pretty darn quickly anyway, because if they get under time and uh, got most of those measures right, we can usually tell the ones they know what they're doing, but they were looking up when we wanted to look to the side. All right, well, I hope you all get a chance to use this. Uh, it's been here and will be around uh, at least the rest of the day. And uh, But I wanted to make sure to make a point about how we're doing measures on here. Thank you.
And it is. It's over there, and it's, I hope to come by and, and feel things because that's the other thing, you know. So now you see how it works, and uh, and one of the things we've put a, a great deal of effort in that I think will pay off on all our future products is it feels like cartilage. It feels like an ACL. It, it's very ergonomically uh, the way I understand a knee to be, and I say that because I've only been in one knee, and that was a cadaver knee, and uh, and in fact when I did that, uh, it's, it's the deal where the residents are all done with it and I get a chance to come in and get on it and everybody scatters and I'm all of a sudden alone on this thing and uh, okay and well uh, that's kind of that's a little harder than I thought I'm a little disappointed my training hasn't made this simple for me you know and I'm looking and thinking what's going on water water's on everything's good but no there was one more valve turn that valve the water comes on the whole thing opens up I'm like okay there we go and and getting around inside there and, and it's interesting because we don't train that in this particular thing. We don't have a switch on there, and we could put a switch on there. It wouldn't be that hard. If we did the switch and turned that down the water, we could make the whole joint come on down like that. And that's one of the kind of flexibilities to add to that. Um, let's see. So the thing is, where we are right now is we're making pretty realistic environments. We're, um, but we are, our training, our, t our testing is all based on the training. Uh, we got these measures, let's say down here, you know, with VR, you know everything about it, but it doesn't mean you understand it. It doesn't mean that you know what they did well. And that's going to be a very interesting place is to take all these measures and turn them into something where an expert can come in and just clean up and a novice doesn't do so well and we can tell the difference. And like I say in there, you know, I've shown this simulator to a lot of folks. I know who I want in my knee and who I don't want in my knee by the time they get out of that thing. Uh, they come, some people, yeah, anyway. But some people get in there and they're so gentle and, you know. And, and one of the, in fact, first time that we were really showing it at one of the academy meetings, uh, a gentleman got in there. And, and put that probe right in front of the camera, and then it made this whole tour where the probe was in front of the camera the whole time. That was inconceivable to me until I spent a lot of hours on this. And so, oh, yeah, okay, it really gets in your hands. There's all these different kinds of things that you train. Um, and, and some things that, that are super important, it's all up here, and you need to know what's going on. You've got to put it together. Uh, and some things, I think, if you could sit there and palpate and find the right marks and put a little dot, you could probably have anybody come up and stick that needle in that half inch that they needed to do after that. In arthroscopy, I think of it very much like a musical instrument and in that there really is a hand-eye thing going on, and you're really a klutz when you first get in there. And this over and over and over just changes how you, you don't even think about it anymore. When you first go in through a portal, in general, you're thinking, i got to go right, so it'll go left. And you're going to take forever to get around in that way. And so VR can be very powerful to get those kinds of things across. Our simulators, when we do that with the mentor, we're very careful to tell them everything they need to know. We give them hint images and do everything we can so that it's very autonomous, so they're not wondering what they're supposed to be doing. And, and to go with the guitar analogy, if you put a guitar in somebody's hand and try to show them a D chord, you can twist their fingers around and get it there, and, and they got to do it over and over and over, and all of a sudden it's, it's in their head. And that's, the kind of, that's where we are right now with being able to do that with arthroscopy. Uh, the AOS has done a very large validation study of this, went around to six, seven different places. There's about f almost 50 people in this. Uh, so it's, it's large, you know, I mean, it's large and relative to what you can often get for your N. Half of them went through the simulator training and the other half went through normal stuff and they all went in the OR afterwards. So we really do have something that's, uh, you know, this is how they truly did afterward. And uh, they'll be reporting on that. I can't talk about the results until they get that out there. Um, we're uh, working on a lot of stuff for maintenance of certification for the military. And in, a, in one sense, this is just a really cool environment to do that. You could have this one thing that's only about yay big with a couple haptics that could have everybody in that combat field hospital coming through there and keeping their skills up. And it has the very nice two-way track on it. If you are uh, doing cataract surgery as your career and you're sent out there, uh, the first thing you're going to be doing is stitching eyes and stitching eyelids and things like that, and you likely haven't done that in a while. And so first weeks out, out there, you're actually learning and getting up to speed on it. And then after that's all wrote for you and you're losing all your skills over the six months of deployment, you're doing back to your fake emulsification, et cetera, that you have no chance whatsoever of doing out in the field. And so, uh, and, and, you know, if you were to put... A simulator for every one of those people around a room, well, it ain't going to work. That's not what a combat hospital is going to look like. It's not what most places are going to look like. But if one device can do that for all the specialties, and that's the, that's the thing about VR is because it's all fake, it can all be generated, then there's a possibility of really pulling that off and having something that's worth the real estate that it takes up. Are there any questions?